By some accounts, he might be the richest Indian in the United States of America today. So why is it that such few people have heard about Manoj Bhargav? Is it because he prefers it that way? Well, even if you haven't heard about him and don't know much about him, we're going to change that today. But you would have certainly heard or seen or perhaps even tried the one product that's taken him to the headlines. It's called the 5R energy drink, and that's right, it's meant to be a heady concoction of caffeine, vitamins, and nutrients. So what's the Manoj Bhargav story all about? Well, he's our newsmaker tonight, and we're going to find out. Manoj, let me start by asking you the obvious question. Why don't we know more about you? Well, in the beginning, there was no purpose. I always felt, I try to do everything that has, it has to have a purpose. Yeah. And being famous, all you get is a bullseye on your forehead. Uh, so there was no attraction there. Yeah. Uh, and the reason everything changed is basically, actually, mostly because of India. Hmm. Um, I want to do charity here. Hmm. And apparently, if you try to do charity and you're a rich guy and nobody knows you, then you must be a thief. So there was a lot of resistance hmm. to me doing anything. Resistance here. from which quarters? Pretty much everywhere, I mean, they were saying, who are you? Are you have some other motive agenda. motives, mm. agenda. Look, we're giving money to the poor, we're building, mm. you know, we're taking care of the poor. What other agenda would I mm. have? But there was a lot of that just everywhere. So I said, all right, I give up, fine. I'll come out and do a, st you know, everybody's been chasing me over there as well. So I said, fine, I'll, I'll do it. And so the first thing was Forbes. Yeah. Um, and you've only just begun to sort of get break your media silence, uh, in a sense. You, you're, you're slowly coming out of that shadow of silence. You, you say that, in a sense, fame means nothing to you. But is it also that you like your, your, your privacy, you like to stay under the radar? You've, you've quipped before that if you Google Manoj Bhargav, uh, it might take you to some lawyer in Singapore. <laughs> well, my view is this. Look, I, I'm not an MBA type of guy. I'm more common sense. Yeah. Uh, so the common sense says, if you become famous, the first thing is you become a target. Yeah. Now, how is that attractive? To me, that, that it is... It comes a, with the turf, right? It, it's a price I wasn't willing to pay. But on the other hand, for charity's sake, I think it's worth it. If I didn't think... I mean, everything you have to pay for. In other words, if you don't think it's worth it, don't pay. Don't buy it. Yeah. The way I look at it is, okay, well, if you guys make me do this, and, and that's the only way I can get this, the charity side done, fine. Uh, I'll do it. Other than that, I don't really, I don't have, I don't have this uh, hobby of being famous. Look, it's like, I, I, and I don't think it's bad for other people, it's like uh, a hobby. Yeah. Some people collect stamps, other people like to be famous. I don't have that hobby. I just look at it in that and sense. And you don't collect stamps, but you do collect gravestones. And I need to explain this, <laughs> I have to explain this to, my, to, to our viewers, which is basically that ever since uh, your product, 5-Hour uh, Energy, became such a huge and gigantic success, yeah. you had copycat products, 6-Hour Energy, 8-Hour Energy, and I believe you have a little symmetry in your office. You chase these uh, copycat guys with lawsuits, and the moment you win, you know, there's that little flag of victory that goes on onto that tombstone. So is this, is this, is this story for real? I think it's expanded a little bit. I mean, I think there was one little tombstone in there because one of our creative guys put it up there as a little rest in peace. Yeah. And uh, so everybody and gets seen, a have, chuckle out of it. So Have you seen many attempts to copy 5-Hour Energy? Yeah, they're about, they're somewhere between 250 and 300. Mm. That included Coke, Pepsi, everybody came in after us. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the ones we went after, I, I know the article says yeah. the secret of my success is I sue everybody. But well, that's not, that, that's just silly because, uh, you know, we sold 500 million bottles last year. Mm. We didn't sue all our customers <laughs> to get that. Do, do, you, do you use 5-Hour Energy yourself? Every day. Do you? Yes. And twice when, and then I, when I play tennis, which is three times a week, I use it again. I never play without it. So what's in it without divulging trade secrets? No. Actually, it's, uh, it's right on the label. Uh, it's basically nutrients that make you focus. Uh, and you said it's not an energy drink, but it's a focus drink, right? right? So 
what, what, what is it? Because you did arrive in a market where Red Bull, for example, right. already existed. Right. So, you know, that was everybody's notions back then of an energy right. drink. So how, how did you think this would be different? Well, look, uh, I found it at one place. And at I a natural product. Yeah, and I, and I, and I thought, yeah. wow, this is amazing. So I, uh, I can, you know, I could sell this. Uh, so I figured it out and uh, basically what it has in it is brain nutrients and the, uh, for brain health. So uh, th there is caffeine in it, but the purpose of caffeine is to get everything else absorbed. Yeah. Most people don't know that one of the great qualities of caffeine is it absorbs, allows you to absorb nutrients. Hmm. And so it does it quickly. So when it does it quickly, you focus. And when you focus, you think you have energy. Or rather, your personal journey mm -hmm. has attracted a, a lot of attention because it's, it's unusual. Uh, you know, you move to the United States of America with your parents, uh, you dabble in all kinds of jobs, but you drop out of Princeton. You hate Princeton. Most people in India would, you know, give a leg and a dime to go to Princeton. So why do you drop out of Princeton? Uh, well, I was, first of all, I, I don't hate Princeton. That was a mis, uh, that misrepresentation. Was, uh, it was okay. a misrepresentation by somebody who went to the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> okay. So beyond the college rivalry or the school rivalry, right. why do you drop out? Well, I, as I, I mean, the Princetonian just interviewed me a few days ago, and I wanted to clear the air because I never said they were bad. Yeah. Know? And the purpose really, to me, was, look, I got, it was great for a year. And they said, why a year? I said, look, it's the same reason why nobody stays for five years. Why five? Why four years? I mean, it's an arbitrary number. Yeah. Uh, I got what I needed out of Princeton in one year, and after that, I didn't think it was useful. Um, partially because, look, you go to school, and the primary reason is you want to make some money. You want to get a good job, and you make some money. It wasn't important to me. I mean, I thought, I mean, my friends were some of the richest people in the world, and they were a little bit they weren't really together they were sort of messed up yeah. a lot of them and I thought what is this mm. I'm trying to be like them that makes no sense so then I thought okay I don't need this and let me find something that's more useful but you move back to India at this point and if in the Western narrative of you you become a monk and you've explained that you know maybe the Western press doesn't have another word to describe that ap approximation but you do spend several years living in ashrams hey, correct w what leads you to that well, look, uh, what happened is, I don't know if this is too much information right now, but I read Vivekanand, and I thought, and I was a youngster, and I thought, if he can do it, so can I. And that's what I did. I followed what he did, not what he said. Mm. And um, it was the greatest education. Now things are easy. I mean, look, I compete against guys who have MBAs. Yeah. I love that, <laughs> because they have no clue. But how many years did you spend in an ashram? Altogether 12. 12 years. Mm -hmm. And then you suddenly go back and you become this entrepreneur. Well, look, it's not a change. 90% uh, of what I make goes to charity. Okay, so uh, I, I don't live that differently because to me it's really simple. Uh, if you have a, more money than your lifestyle, then you can either do something stupid or, or smart. That's not much of a choice. That's like saying you're on the roof. You can either take the elevator or you can jump. You know, that, that's not a choice. So the only reasonable thing is you do something for other people. Mm. Do you find that the philanthropy debate, though, is also mired in a certain degree of cynicism because sometimes people see it here in India, especially as a way of saving tax. You will find that when Forbes profiled you, they also suggested that your own charity uh, had been subject to scrutiny, that there was a suggestion that they, you were right. making use of a convenient law to right. actually invest within other operations that act also brought you money. So, you know, in a sense, a lot of people look at rich people who donate and say, hey, right. it's just a way of saving tax. Look. For me not to save tax would be stupid, okay? Then I yeah. would be called a stupid rich man, you know? So there's always a, yeah. a way. Uh, the, the thing is, we are, we've set up an organization here, and what we do is give to, last year we gave to 400 organizations in India mm. because it's very hard to do charity, you know? Mm. I, I saw a piece that you did on with Ted Turner and so yeah. on, and a lot of the, the, the ideas are false. I mean, the people have ideas which are just not, true um, like look I instead of IT what you really need is common sense you know it, it for example if you go to a poor man and he's starving and you say look let me give you books let me give you a computer and he's gonna look at you are you out of your mind I'm gonna die tomorrow and you're gonna give me a computer mm. uh, or the guy's blind and you say no I'm gonna give you a vaccine uh, wait a second 
It's simple just as businesses. You go to the customer and you say, what is it that you need? Yeah. Not what I want to shove down your throat. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of charity being done that is pointless because people sit behind, the rich people sit behind, uh, you know, big desks and fancy houses, and they've never been there. Have they ever done anything that, that uh, you know, have you been down into the, in, into the, uh, where everybody is living? And in a sense, have you seen life from the other side of the tracks, as it were? You've driven a cab in New York, you've, I, I mean, if, I, if, if, if the, the, the stories are correct, you've, you've taken, you know, you've bought a car and worked in a low-income housing colony, bringing down debris, got down and dirty in a sense, right. as you made your money. Yeah. How much of the rough life have you seen, according to you? Well, I don't know. I don't really consider it rough, but yes, I, uh, I, I carried stones for in, in construction. I mean, patthar and literally, then I, literally, literally patthar doin. Literally. Hmm. And I uh, almost broke my back doing it. Uh, and I did work in the ghetto, and I did drive a cab, and I did work in a press, and I did do all of those things. Look, it gives you a perspective that you can never get in some fancy school. Yeah. Okay. And if you... I mean, look, in, in, in where we are, where, where I do, or the other, what in the U.S. they call us founders. Yeah. You know, if you built a large business, you're a founder, apparently. And I've met these other guys. I mean, we all talk to sure. some extent. And they're all a lot like me in the sense that they're not fancy education. Uh, if there was some common element among us, it's we're all stubborn. We all don't tolerate uh, nonsense. Yeah. Uh, we're not politically correct. Yeah. And we don't really care what anybody thinks. There's a word, I don't know if you're familiar with it, called jugar, uh, which is the Indian... Oh, yeah. Yeah? yeah. That, you, that you, you innovate. When you don't have a conventional answer, you innovate. But some also use it as a byword. Some use it as a byword for innovation, others for mediocrity, for not putting systems in place. No, no, I, I, I think there's a big bias in India for educated people. You know, it's like, oh, IIT and IIM must be smart. No, that only means he's smart in studying. It doesn't mean he's smart in business. Yeah. But no, we only hire IIT and which is total nonsense because they come out of these schools and they're clueless. I mean, they're taught by people who haven't done business. Yeah. I mean, would you be willing to op be operated by a surgeon who was taught by somebody who never did surgery? I mean, it's, it's ludicrous. If so you you're saying overemphasis on pedigree, on degrees, on, on, that whole, on, on that whole circuit, as it were, that Indians are obsessed with. But, but can, I, can, I, can I ask you? I have you, a quote on this one. Yes. I, I don't usually quote authors, but this one was just great. It says, I've never let schooling get in the way of my education. That's a good one. That was from Mark Twain. That is a good one. And, and I, I hope Princeton doesn't take that personally in your case. But so be it. But let me ask you, uh, in the end, you, you did say in that interview to Forbes that you're probably the richest Indian in the United States of America. And you said it in this off-the-cuff way. Uh, you know. But you're also saying simultaneously that ostentatious display of wealth for you is a problem. You, you, it, it doesn't mean that much to your money. Is, is that what you're saying? Well, no, what does I money mean I, I don't you? say that it's bad. Everybody has a hobby, is what I said. Is that, what's yours? Uh, I, I guess my life would be the, the charity side. That's what my hobby is, besides tennis. Uh, this is what I do. So now that we've uh, actually taken the reclusive Manoj Bhargav and put him in the <laughs> media spotlight, what next for you? Last question as we end. Well, I've got projects that, I've got four projects that are all sort of world changing, if, if they are successful. So I'm doing things which and there's the nonprofit side, but I'm also doing other things where one of the largest projects, the largest of the four, is we are able to find a technology that will clean ocean water 80% mm. uh, cheaper than currently. And it can be used in agriculture, which current technology cannot, which would change the world. So we're, we're plus we're working on diesel, which uh, uh, reduced diesel consumption by 20%. Uh, also, uh, to this week, actually, it's being tested. We have a technology for coal which will take 98% of mercury out of coal and 60% of sulfur dioxide, which again will change everything. So we're doing, uh, you know, we're investing in those things. Now, these are not called non-profit. Yeah. Um, they're definitely for-profit, and yeah. I don't pretend that, you know, yeah. I'm doing, saving the world or anything. It's just business. On the other hand, it turns out that doing really large projects, all of a sudden I'm green. I didn't even know it. <laughs> well, so. best things in life just happen circumstantially, but somehow uh, I have a feeling that you won't stay 
away from the media spotlight for too much longer because probably the media won't let you. Manoj Bhargav, thank you so much for talking to us.